So it's a very small distillery here. Everything's done in one room just for health and safety. Watch your feet. The floor is wet. There are hoses and things to trip on, but we'll try and stay together. Craig's just going to turn everything off and quieten it down for me. So we'll start at the very back. <clears throat> Can you turn the steam off, please? So we've got our grain here that arrives just in these 25 kilo bags from Crisp. It's already crushed. So we don't have a mill here because we're just far too small to have a big, big bit of equipment like that. So if you're not familiar, you can pick some up, you can taste it. There should be some sweetness there. So the bags arrive like this and we carry 16 of these in by hand just from here and tip them into this elevator. This is much, much better. It takes the grain upstairs for us into this metal hopper. Previously, we were carrying these bags in, running upstairs with them across the gantry and tipping them into the hopper. It was the worst part of my day. I hated it. Sure. So 16 per minute. Yeah, 400 kilos. Yeah. Right. And it come, you need, yeah, it's just the worst part of the day. And in summer, and especially with the sparge water, you can see the steam right. coming up. It's like 40 degrees. So, so pleased to get an elevator in. <laughs> so this just runs on air and takes it up and the guys can do it in as quick as seven minutes. Wow. So there's a small competition between them, <laughs> but that works. So yeah, from here, we've got our, our grain that goes upstairs ahead of the next mash. And then if we go around, we'll look in the mash tun. Did you say we could taste it? Yeah, you can taste it. I'm just curious. There like... Just should be a wee bit of sweetness. Yeah, so we're the only distillery that predominantly uses Maris Otter. It's the only kind of barley that we've used here. So it's predominantly used in the brewing industry. It doesn't yield as much alcohol. Normally distilleries are all about the numbers. They want to get yield up as high as possible and just get the whiskey churning out. So we're quite lucky here because things, we do take our time with things and we can kind of do what we want. We'll prioritise flavour. So this gives us a really creamy spirit and we're sticking with it. We've used it for 10 years. That's and, the decision from the start. Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. But we, we're behind it. We, we do really support it. We can do some small batches easily in future just by throwing a few different bags in there. We just haven't done it yet. But I think we're making some really good spirit. So we're happy. Scary numbers for the big distilleries. So distilling malt, you could yield 410 litres of alcohol, pure alcohol. We are hitting about 370. Still It's not bad because here we are so manual that if we take this hose apart to do the next part of the process, we'll spill a bit of wort on the ground and that's all yield. We're so manual here that we are making, we are, we've got losses. But the big distilleries, if they were all plumbed in, all hard lines, stainless steel pipes, they wouldn't have any drips, any losses anywhere. So it all comes down to that as well. But yeah, if I shifted to another mall, a distilling mall, I would see the numbers going up. Would make me happy on one hand. But if the spirit isn't as like delicious, then we can't really, yeah. Yeah, so when Douglas Lane took over, they put a lot of investment in. Yeah. So this was during COVID, okay. when things were quite quiet here mm -hmm. and a good opportunity to do so. So we've got a new mash tun. Yeah, so, English mash tun. Mm, yeah. yeah. So previously we had an open topped mash tun. Very traditional. We, we would have two men with a paddle in mixing it. But you lose a lot of heat out of that. It's not very efficient and yield wouldn't have been as good again because of that. So when I started, yield was closer to like 240 LA per ton. I've got it up to 370, mm -hmm. so done well. They previously had smaller stills, but I'll go into that detail. 
so the stills have been upgraded and a new steam generator we need steam for everything here so that was a huge investment right. and even the tasting room or snug which you'll see later everything in fact they've done a lot they've done a lot probably cost initial oh, cost yeah. um it's pretty it's pretty cool when you go in and you see something like that. Traditionalists like to see that. But in reality, yeah, you've just got the heat loss, your mash temperature won't be maintained, your yield will be down. Started in 2013. 2013, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they were predominantly a gin distillery then. Okay. With a little bit of whiskey. Ah, okay. Whereas now we're all about whiskey. You're not doing gin anymore, do you? We do some. Yeah. So we've got a gin still yeah. here. <laughs> My question for Sarah. Yeah. Tiny, 300 litres. Beautiful. Cute. Is it only yeah. for gin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a Noga? Oga? Uh, Oga. Oga. Yeah. Oga from Portugal. Portugal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got some historic contracts from previous Strathairn. They used to make probably most gins in Scotland before the gin boom and all the gin distilleries were built. So they were mostly made here, but they probably wouldn't tell you that. So there's still a couple of contracts that we do. I wouldn't name them, but yeah, it was made here. Mm -hmm. So we'll move around, have a look at the mash tun. Yeah, so we've got our green upstairs. We've already mashed in today, so you'll be able to look in and see a small bit of action. We've got two hot water tanks upstairs. So we set these by hand, just using the steam valves at the back and get them ready for mashing in. So ideally, we're wanting to combine a thousand litres of water, 400 kilos of grain, and try and hit a strike, a temperature of 64.5 degrees which is quite hard when we're not automated at all. So if it's cold outside, your mash tun, even though you've preheated it, it won't be as hot as you want it. So you do need to tweak temperatures based on the weather, based on whether, whether it's the first shift in the morning when it's really cold or the second shift in the afternoon and the room's got a bit of heat. So that's down to the guys to just tweak things. So we start by preheating. We'll open the bottom of the hot liquor tank upstairs. Water flows in by gravity just through one of these red hoses. And once we've got a bit of base liquor in the bottom, just about this much, we'll then open this black valve at the bottom of the stainless steel tank and let all the grains start to flow in. So we've got a ladder at the back and at the same time we're up there and we're looking to see how thick the mash looks. We want a porridge consistency. No big dry lumps, no wet patches. We've got rakes inside, which we put on for half an hour. That helps us with that consistency. But it's down to the guys just monitoring it by eye. It takes like 40 minutes to mash in, which is a very long time for such a small mash tun. But everyone's done by gravity, so we're at that mercy. So you can look in, you can see the steam's coming out. So it is hot. This stills on. This is boiling. Do not touch it. But you can look in there if you want. I'll just have a nosy. Yeah. So the sparge is finished. So it's under a bit of water just now. But I'll get a torch. So from here, we would have a porridge. So we're going to drain the liquids out of the porridge, which is called wort. And it's a bit orangey. It's really sweet, sugary. And it's the sugar that we want, which will then convert to alcohol by adding yeast later. So at the bottom, we would collect the wort through this red hose. A tiny little filter, which just keeps some of the, the grain particles back. We sh none should get through the perforated bottom. 
We're only looking for liquids, but in case any gets through, this tiny filter will catch it. Then the liquids will go through the, the next lot of red hoses and into the heat exchanger. This uses cold water, which goes in on the other side of the metal. And we just take the, cold, the coldness of the water and cool down the wort from about 64 degrees down to 20. 20 degrees is where the yeast, we can then add it and it'll be happy. It's not going to kill it, not going to scald it. So we can follow the hose. This will come out at 20 degrees. And then we're going into fermenter number three or washback number three. <clears throat> so we're going to collect that for about two hours up to about a foot from the top, really. At the same time, we need to add some more liquid to the mash tun. And we would call this a sparge, which is like a shower over the mash tun. So it's already happened today. That's how there's a bit of water sitting on top there. That will all trickle through, collect the last of the sugars, and we'll get it all into the mash tun. So after that point, we'll get a couple of buckets. We'll weigh out one kilo of dried yeast, a really small amount. The yeast is it's dried, so we need to rehydrate it kind of wake it up it's just asleep when you get it and so we'll add it into 10 liters of 32 degree water and then we'll start to give it some wort just to acclimatize it so that it knows what it's going into and you can see it sitting in a bucket and it starts to bubble away so it's definitely alive and then we've got ladders well platform steps and we'll tip the yeast in the top so super manual We use a yeast from AB Biotech or AB Maori, and it's a high temperature yeast. So during a fermentation, the temperature naturally rises from about 20 degrees up to about 35 degrees. So it can be quite hot in here, which is quite nice in winter. Um, you also get CO2 being given off, so it's quite bubbly. Um, <clears throat> we switch to a high temperature yeast just to give us maybe an extra degree or two, maybe up to 36, 37 degrees. And it gave us a bit more yield because at that temperature, yeast will naturally die off. So we're just counteracting that by using a, um, I guess a stronger strain of yeast, a more robust strain. But we can have a look in these fermenters if we go upstairs, because this was done last night. This is last night's shift and this is yesterday morning shift. So the fermentation should be quite active. Uh, with about 12 hours between them, we should see a difference. So we head upstairs, just hold on to the handles. Hi. <laughs> So this is last night's and that was yesterday morning. So you can see the difference already. Mm. The first one, it's risen right up. Like I said, we've got this down to a fine art. This is not going to come over. <laughs> but there's a good bit of heat in there already. I don't think I've ever seen like, the facility <laughs> yeah. coming up to the top like this. We take some safe risks here. Yeah. <laughs> but you can taste this. Whiskey fermentation isn't super sterile. It's not like beer. But you can taste that there's still a bit of sugar. Yeah, still very early. You can feel the heat in it as well already. Yeah, so we have very long fermentations here. So traditionally, they're normally about three or four days. The big distilleries are normally trying to get their washbacks emptied as quick as possible to get the next batch in. We're a lot more chilled out here. We've got really long fermentations of about six days. So we're trying to get as much sugar converted to alcohol as possible. But at the end of that, I mean, after about four days, your fermentation will really die down. But lactic acid bacteria naturally comes in on the air and infects it kind of has a secondary fermentation effect and gives it quite a sour taste, really sour. If you like sour beers, you would probably love it. I'm kind of on the edge. 
But what we find is that it gives us a really fruity spirit. So again, we like the long fermentations. Do you keep it closed all the time or do you have it open? Can we keep it closed? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long is it meant for in total? Six days. Six days. Mm -hmm. About 144 hours. So give or take, we don't work weekends or Friday nights here. There's only three of us, so it's just finding a nice balance where everyone's quite happy to come to work and they're not feeling like they're here all, all the time. So some of the fermentations are as short as 96 hours and some are a wee bit longer than 140. So on average, 144. So we run nine shifts a week for whiskey in here. So Monday to Thursday, we do two shifts. So Craig and Matthew are on separate shifts. And then Friday, we do a shift in the morning and then a short cleaning shift in the afternoon just to get the mash tun done, the stills, because otherwise they're always full. So they'll handle the whole place one at a time? Mm -hmm. So it's just one person being the whole mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I get to sit in the office now because <laughs> I can't do much. So normally I would do holiday cover or if anyone's off sick. But yeah, I'm just making sure ordering's happening, spirits going out. Um, but yeah, it's quite a good, a good yeah. gig. Yeah. <laughs> it's been hard though, I must say. Yeah. It's been hard. <clears throat> so at the end of the fermentation, after six days, you've got quite a strong beer, about 8%, very sour, just not to my taste, but it makes an excellent whiskey at the end of it. So we would pump from this fermenter and just straight in each sill. So we would connect up to wash still one first, fill that and then turn the steam on and then start pumping into wash still two and then fill that and turn the steam on. So what we've got coming out here is called Low Wines. Cheers. Thanks. So I'll skip back. This is the end of fermentation. This is our wash, which will then go into the stills. So this is like the beer. So if you want to try it, you can. Uh. <laughs> Quite dry as well. All that sugar's gone, which is great for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we've got low wines coming out here. You can taste this as well. What's it's it's sitting at about 40% just now, but it's only had one distillation and traditionally scotch always goes through two or three, but it needs a bit of work. Yeah, it's not pleasant. It needs some more work. So the low wines is what then on the following shift goes into the spirit still. The yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're all 1,000 litres. So when you come to the spirit still, so we've got an ascending line arm here, which gives us quite a light spirit. Because everything that's coming up here, the, the vapour that's coming up here condenses in the line arm and goes back to the spirit still and then is redistilled again. So it comes out here. And the first part is called the heads or the four shots. And it's quite bitter. It's not very pleasant. And it also has some methanol, which makes you blind drunk. So that's where that phrase comes from. This is now the heart spirit. So as long as you keep electronics away, you can have a smell. You can have a wee taste. But it's a lot stronger. This is probably about 71%. But we're tasting for the cut points here. So the only fancy bit of equipment. We have is this mm. and it will check the ABV. So we'll see if I'm right. <laughs> oh. Down at 65% sitting at 19, 19 degrees, which is nice and safe. Any higher and we would have alcohol vapor. You'd be able to smell it. It would be in the air. It would make it a really explosive, flammable environment. 
Yeah. Summer we use a lot more water, especially because water temperatures in the condensers are a bit hotter. So there's not that cooling potential that we're used to in winter. Winter's definitely the best time for whiskey distilleries. So yeah, we're making the cut points by taste and smell. That's a huge luxury for us. In big distilleries, there's normally a spirit safe, which is a big brass box. The spirit flows behind the glass behind the padlock, no one can smell, taste, mm. take samples. But HMRC, they're very happy with us. They're very trustworthy. They do visit every year, just make sure everything's going well and as expected. So, yeah. Then at the end, so we'll probably collect about this much hearts. It will vary a little bit, although we're doing the same thing day in and day out. The thing, the process is so manual, so we might get this much harsh, and it all depends on the taste. If we think it's tasting really good, we'll collect a bit more. If it's not tasting as good and it's more oily, like tails or faints, we'll just cut it. Um, yeah, all the spirit, the heart goes into the faraway container outside. And when I've got about nine of them sitting next door, the warehouse is absolutely full and I'll send this away to Douglas Lane in Glasgow and our staff down there will put it into cask for us and later on they'll bottle it. So it's as in-house as it can be. We just don't have the space to do anymore or the manpower. Warehousing takes a lot. And our spent grain all goes to a local farmer or to the bakery in Methven, as you know. And all the pot ale or spent lees, the liquid effluent that's left over in the stills at the end of the day, that goes to a biodigester to make sustainable methane and water. So it's as sustainable as it can be.